Okay, so let's start. First of all, this is just in the beginning, they have just given us all the uh, normal pathophysiology and which we already know and have studies. You should know these two uh, physical changes, uh, sorry, the three changes. They can ask you as an MCQ question, like what is goodwill sign or a lady coming to you, she's pregnant and on um, physical examination, there's softening of the cervix at four to six weeks or there's bruised discoloration of the cervix on physical examination. So uh, is it you just uh, is it normal finding? Is there something abnormal? So you should know. So just try to uh, know these three signs: goodwill sign, uh, goodwill sign that what is it? Softening of the cervix at four to six weeks. Similarly, in Chadwick, there will be bluish discoloration of the uh, cervix and vagina at six weeks on physical examination. And Hagar sign is softening of the cervical isthmus at six to eight weeks. Physical changes, they've just given the <clears throat> normal physiology that what changes come in pregnant uh, during the pregnancy, the ch changes in the skin, like in there will be increased um, pigmentation, increase um, uh, um, like dyspnea, there can be little stages of pregnancy. Uh, similarly, the person, uh, some endocrine changes like um, increase in, uh, blood glucose levels, increase um, thyroid, uh, thyroid hormone levels. So just a journal increase uh, urination, frequency of urination. She can have constipation. So all these are the journal uh, changes. Now, first of all, if the uh, woman is coming to you for the first time, okay, it's her first time she's pregnant and first visit. So what are the things we have to do in the uh, first visit or she's coming to you before she wants to get pregnant? Like she's just here for the counseling that I, I want to conceive and what should I do? So first of all, we have to start her on prenatal vitamins. And if they do not mention that she's taking any folic acid, we always have to start her on folic acid. Okay, if she's taking any other medication, like um, uh, for say she's on warfarin and she's coming to you for uh, counseling so um, to get pregnant. So what will we do? We will ask her to continue taking warfarin and then refer her to the um, uh, department, her OVS, gynae, so that they can know that how slowly we have to taper it off and switch to another medication because we just can't abruptly stop the medication. Even if she says that I have been, um, I'm seizure free for two years or three years, but no, we can't just stop it. Or if uh, a pregnant lady is coming to you and she, she got pregnant, she's on warfarin and now she knows that, okay, warfarin is teratogenic. What shall I do now? So we will never stop warfarin. We will tell her to continue taking the medication and we will monitor you meanwhile. Okay. Similar, these are the conditions where um, here in Canada... Uh, a normal pregnancy that is seen by the family physician, she will even uh, conduct the vaginal delivery or if you want to go for a uh, midwife. If any of these complications are there, then you uh, refer them to the obstetrician. So what are these? She has insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus. She has previous cesarean section and now she wants to go for a vaginal delivery, uh, multiple gestation, malpresentation, active antepartum hemorrhage, preterm labor, prom, uh, failure to progress or descend, induction or augmentation. Uh, similarly, there's second or third degree during uh, delivery if there's a postpartum uh, hemorrhage. What will we do? We will immediately consult an obstetrician. Retain placenta, IUGR, and <clears throat> PPH. So all of these we have to consult an obstetrician. We have to give her a folic acid. If it is a high-risk pregnancy, we have to give them a high dose of folic acid. Like if she's on a uh, warfarin, then we won't give her 0.4 mg. It is a 4 to 5 mg of folic acid daily. What are the initial screenings we have to do? Rubella, um, hepatitis B surface antigen, VDRL, pap smear, gonorrhea, chlamydia, HIV, and then uh, TB testing only if she's living in a high-risk area or she traveled from a high-risk area or, uh, for example, she's an indigenous uh, um, a lady coming to you, living in the reserves. So over there, there are high risk uh, of tuberculosis. It's still the high. So we can check them for uh, tuberculosis also. We have to ask the history of whether she's vaccinated for varicella or no. Remember, varicella vaccination is contraindicated in pregnancy. Uh, we do not give it in pregnancy. Uh, power virus immunity if exposed to 
children. A, a lady might come to you. She's working in a daycare uh, with children and she is she's pregnant and she has a, a recent some flu like symptoms. So it can be that she might have uh, had parvovirus infection. So for that, what do we have to do? We just have to monitor her uh, serially. During the pregnancy, we'll just monitor her for any IUGR, any um, abnormality, and nothing else will be given. <clears throat> then if any uh, um, genetic counseling for high-risk group, like for example, um, a, a, a couple is coming to you with a cystic sorry excuse me uh, cystic fibrosis so what is the next step we have to counsel them okay um about the uh, risk about the genetic counseling if there is any heredity uh, disease in the family then uh, we have to first counsel them <clears throat> tell them about the risk of the child carrying the same uh, same disease the same abnormality what uh, what are the chances we can prevent them what are what will be the other um, uh, lifestyle changes, how they will uh, proceed with the pregnancy or after the baby is born, how they will take care of it. <clears throat> and always um, the, the investigations when a mother is coming for the first time, the initial investigations, we have to do blood grouping, RH status to check whether she's negative or no, any antibody screening. Most important over here is this urine uh, culture and sensitivity oh, the pregnancy is the only condition even <clears throat> in which if the um, uh, uti she has it's asymptomatic we have to treat them otherwise in a normal woman if the uti is asymptomatic we do not treat it okay we leave it like that but in pregnancy if she's uh, asymptomatic but she has the culture and sensitivity is positive we have to treat her because there will be an increased risk of preterm labor. So if they're asking you for one, um, um, three, uh, six weeks, seven weeks old, uh, 20 years old, or any 30 years um, old lady is coming to you uh, for her initial uh, workup or initial uh, visit of um, after conception, what is the one step you will do? We have to always screen her for urine culture and sensitivity, even if they do not tell us any symptoms. And if they say she's asymptomatic and the uh, culture and sensitivity is, uh, turns out to be positive, next step, treat her. Give her amoxicillin or nitrofurantine during the pregnancy. And on every visit, we have to take urine culture and sensitivity. Similarly, we have to um, uh, do this, um, what do you call, uh, uh, PCR or urine culture for gonorrhea and chlamydia trachomatous. Nausea and vomiting, they're coming to you with um, um, Increase nausea, vomiting. Um, what is the first step we have to do? We have to counsel them to take small frequent meals. We won't just immediately put them on medications. We have to tell them that it is normal, okay? And then start them on, um, if they are they are giving you a CDM question, a, um, a pregnant lady is coming to you at 12 weeks of gestation with um, uh, increased nausea and vomiting or early morning nausea. Um, uh, what is the next step? We have to counsel her on, uh, tell her that um, uh, take uh, small frequent meals, okay? Increase sleep and rest. If still uh, after your initial assessment, uh, she has not improved or you gave her the initial um, counsel her about small frequent meals, um, take something immediately when you get up in the morning, still it is not helping her. What is the next step? We have to give her pyridoxine either monotherapy or doxylamine. We can give her, we can then, uh, next step is to move to H1 receptor antagonist and then on densitron is the last step. If uh, she's going with hypermesis gravidarum, we have to admit her. Okay, first we will admit her, we will do her test, we'll check her beta ACG level because there can be different causes. We will do an ultrasound to check if the pregnancy is normal or not. Maybe it's a twin, a twin gestation, maybe it's a hereditary form mole. So we will do the beta HCG, check the levels of the beta HCG, do the um, abdominal ultrasound to check for any abnormality in the pregnancy and the treatment is the same. Except first we have to admit her, keep her NPO, start with, if there's any signs of dehydration, we have to treat her, start her IV fluids, then slowly return back to meals and give her vitamin B6, onin syndrome, diphenhydramine. <clears throat> If they have a family history of any of this, they are coming like for cystic fibrosis, 
uh, CFTR gene uh, DNA analysis and genetic counseling. In all of these, we are doing genetic counseling. Sickle cell disease, we have to do um, uh, hemoglobin, uh, electrophoresis, CBC, thalassemia, same. And along with that, what are we doing? Genetic counseling. So one thing that is important over here is genetic counseling to the family, along with the blood test, because they will give you that, okay, the uh, couple is positive for thalassemia, the couple is positive for fragile X syndrome, what is the next step? So next step, they have already told you that they are uh, positive and they have it in the family, either one or both of them. So next time, uh, step they are asking you is to send them for genetic counseling. Initially coming, these all we discussed, we have to do them. Then you should just know that at what week, what we are performing, like at 10 to 12 weeks, we can do a chorionic villus sampling, um, then 15 to 16 amniocentesis. These are only done in high risk pregnancies and where there are chances like, okay, there can be abnormalities they, at though in only those pregnancies we are doing uh, CVS. We won't be doing CVS in every pregnancy or every lady coming to us. The main that is important is over here. Like um, if she's coming, these we conduct in everyone. So if uh, a 24 year, uh, 24 week, uh, 25 week uh, lady is coming to you uh, for her uh, uh, visits, um, normal, regular visit, everything is normal in pregnancy. What is one screening test you will do? So at this time, we have to do uh, gestational uh, diabetes screening. Okay, so we will do OGCT test or oral glucose tolerance test 75 gram. Any one of these we can do. Similarly, at 28 weeks, we have to check her for, um, uh, um, if she is RH negative, then we have to give her Rogam. Um, at 35 to 37 weeks, we have to do a GBS screening. Similarly, six weeks postpartum, now the baby has been delivered. What are the things we have to do? We have to discuss contraception with her. We have to discuss... Um, what is the, um, um, sorry, uh, if she has any symptoms of any depression, any issues with breastfeeding, we have to counsel her about breastfeeding. We have to provide her with psychological support at six weeks. If uh, her pap smear is uh, due, then we will do her pap smear also. Okay. This is just a uh, chorionic villus sampling. What are the advantages, disadvantages? When do we do them? Mostly amniocentesis, it helps in the uh, screening for open neurotube defect. Similarly, for chorionic villus sampling, it helps us where it is done earlier than, um, sorry, amniocentesis, uh, rapid karyotyping uh, within... <clears throat> 48 hours, we get the uh, results and high sensitivity and specificity. Just the screening test. They don't ask these tests a lot. They, what they want you to know is at what week, what screening test we are doing. Okay. Then we have this. Okay, the fetal surveillance. Now, if you know the normal tracing, okay, we when we are monitoring the baby, uh, like if a mother is coming and we have to check first thing, if the mother is coming and she's saying that she cannot feel the baby uh, movements or there's any such, first thing is we have to uh, give her the um, kick count, okay? So we will uh, tell her to uh, go home and uh, start uh, doing the kick count or paper and just every time you uh, feel the kick, uh, tear it. Then again, you feel it, tear it. So if in... Um, at two hours, there are six or more kicks. It is normal, okay? But if at any time we, are, uh, we feel that, no, the uh, movement of the baby or the kicks of the baby are uh, less than the expected, then we move to the non-stress test, okay? And what? Uh, how do we do it? Fetal heart rate tracing more than 20 minutes using an external Doppler to assess heart rate and its relationship to the fetal movements. Now, in this um, the uh, tracings, what do we need to know? If you know the normal tracing and the abnormal, okay? If you know category one, category two, then anything that is not category one or category three, that is that falls in category two, okay? So what is the normal uh, heartbeat of the baby? It is between 110 to 160 beats per minute. This is the normal range. And baby, the baseline is 110 to 160. Similarly, there can be a variability of 6 to 25 beats above and below. 
and there's no in normal uh, fetal tracings there are no um, decelerations if there are decelerations then there's something abnormal similarly there will be accelerations but spontaneous not like a regular accelerations and um, it's normal it means if all of this they are giving you a tracing in which uh, the baseline the heart rate is 120 um uh, 10 variabilities of beats per minute there's no deceleration some uh, accelerations then it is normal heart rate tracing nothing just to reassure her if there is uh, the abnormal in ab what is in abnormal category three either the heartbeat is less than 110 less than 100 beats per minute or the heartbeat will be very high <clears throat> more than 60 beats per minute then there will be a variability of less than five or more than 25 similarly there will be repetitive uh, decelerations after every few beats there will be deceleration maybe uh, falling less than 100 beats per minute so that is a warning sign <clears throat> there will be no accelerations. Usually they in category three, the accelerations are absent. This shows that the, if there are decelerations coming and the heart uh, the um, uh, heart rate is less than 100 or above, it is continuously, continuously more than 160. It can be due to um, mother, uh, is uh, she has fever. Because of that, the baby is also having tachycardia or mother is hyperthyroid. So then it means there's some, possible fetal compromises going on when we have to take on some action. Now, depending upon the uh, findings, then if um, yeah, if uh, no observed accelerations of fetal movement in the first 20 minutes, now when we are uh, observing the baby, we are doing this Doppler ultrasound and we are checking the uh, heart rate of the baby. If along with these heart rates, in the first 20 minutes, there is no movement. The heart rate is normal, but there's no movement. What will we do? We just uh, give some uh, fundal pressure, uh, hydrate the mother, uh, um, uh, change the position so that maybe the baby is in the sleep cycle, the baby wakes up and starts moving. And we continue to monitor for 30 minutes. Similarly, in biophysical profile, what are we doing? It, in this, we will do the ultrasound assessment of the fetus with or without the non-stress test. In this, we are in the ultrasound, we have to check these things. Um, sorry, four things. And each of this has two points. So we check the tone of the baby, we check the movement, we check the breathing, and we check the volume of the amniotic fluid, which should be two by two. In which conditions we are doing? Post-term pregnancy, decreased fetal movements. Mother is coming to you that she cannot feel the movements of the baby. IUGR or any um, signs of fetal distress or uteroplacental insufficiency. In that cases, we have to do the biophysical profile also. And if the uh, it is taken out from 10. If it is less than uh, 6 by 10, then what do we do? We repeat it in 24 hours. If less than that, anything less than that, 0 to 4, then we have to consider for delivery, either vaginal delivery or cesarean, depending upon the condition. Okay. Similarly, for the counseling of the mother, the pregnant patient is coming to you. <clears throat> Same, start her on prenatal uh, vitamins, start her on folic acid, start her on, if she's uh, anemic, anemic, then in the second trimester, we can start her on uh, folic acid, uh, sorry, iron supplements, um, a calcium, vitamin D, we have to give her, and uh, for caffeine, we have to tell her one to two cups are okay, safe in pregnancy. If, she's, if she takes coffee, one to two, or tea, one to two cups are fine, but more than that should be avoided. Um, for uh, eating, we have to tell her that she should avoid raw raw meat, raw fish, raw um, uh, eggs, all these things because they can cause uh, listeriosis or toxoplasmosis. A pregnant lady coming to you with a history of eating outside and now she's presenting with diarrhea. Okay, she had uh, sushi outside uh, last um, last night and now she has diarrhea. So uh, we can think maybe she's having listeriosis or toxoplasm, depending upon the history they are giving. So we will ha have to manage her uh, symptomatically. Then we will have to counsel her about her diet. If she's coming for the first time, um, um, this uh, for the mercury level, it is very important for the indigenous population. Indigenous women coming to you for the first time counseling and most of her food uh, contains fish. Over there, they mostly eat fish. So we have to counsel her about the uh, consumption of top predator fish such as shark, swordfish, mackerel, tilefish to avoid it in her diet. And we have to tell her that this is the limit 
of mercury and she cannot take uh, more than that that amount the uh, the recommended amount so uh, an indigenous woman coming to you for the first time with counseling in her diet uh, um, she mostly eats uh, fish um, what is the next step everything else is fine counsel her about the consumption of the fit, uh, fish <clears throat> A lifestyle, we can tell her that, okay, a moderate amount of exercise is normal and it is good for you um, uh, until you can speak. So there's a talk, what we call talk test. So while she's uh, exercising and she can talk, then that is good, fine for her. But if it is a high-risk pregnancy, she has um, incompetent cervix, she has hypertension, she's diabetic, any history of preterm labor, abortions, then we will uh, tell her that, no, she needs to avoid it. <clears throat> For uh, smoking, uh, we already did this in family medicine that um, for smoking, uh, we always have to first counsel them. And in pregnancy, if they want to quit, then if they're not able to quit, we will give them nicotine replacement uh, patches or therapy. <clears throat> for alcohol, we have to tell them that uh, there is no, even if she's taking one glass of uh, alcohol in a week or in a day, we have to tell her that no amount of alcohol is safe in pregnancy. So she cannot uh, take any amount of alcohol or any other drugs uh, during the pregnancy because there can be increased risk of um, abortions or their feet, uh, alcohol uh, syndrome, fetal alcohol syndrome. We have to tell her about the congenital anomalies. So if she's alcoholic, tell her, counsel her to stop taking alcohol and counsel her about the abnormalities in the baby. Similarly, if she takes cocaine or any other drug like cannabis, tell her about IUGR, tell her about microcephaly, that these can be the causes and this can affect the baby. We just have to counsel them. We will not report anyone. We will not do anything. Our job is just to counsel them, just to uh, aware, uh, make them aware of the uh, side effects. Then it is up to them if they stop or not. Okay. <clears throat> Similarly, what medications are, if she's coming for some mild pain, acetaminophen is fine. We can give her for pre in pregnancy. She can take that. Rest, you should know that what medications are contraindicated. So these are the medications that are contraindicated in pregnancy and she should not take them. If she is on any one of these medications, then we have to uh, further refer her. We won't just immediately stop them. We will uh, counsel her and uh, refer her to the ops or the um, whoever person has given her uh, the speciality like if she is on warfarin she has some seizures maybe to the neurologist to discuss further options immunization it is very important um, they do ask questions about immunization you should know that um, which uh, uh, vaccinations are contraindicated in re pregnancy and which are um, indicated in pregnancy so what are indicated we if a pregnant woman is coming we have to give her tdap uh, irrespective or of her pregnancy like if she was pregnant last year also she got her tdap shot she will get tdap this year also this time also so irrespective of the uh, last shot whenever she's pregnant she has to take tdap similarly we give uh, give them influenza vaccination Apart from that, measles, mumps, and rubella, polio, all the live vaccinations, they are contraindicated. Varicella is very important. They can ask you a question. A pregnant lady coming to you with exposure to a child or uh, uh, someone in her family, they got uh, varicella and they, uh, she was exposed to it. What is the next step? So we have to give her varicella immunoglobulin. We will not give her vaccine. Vaccine is contraindicated, so we will give her immunoglobulin. Or uh, they can give you a question like um, a pregnant lady coming to you. Uh, she was exposed to someone. Uh, she met someone 10 days ago. And now she came to know that that person got chicken pox. She's worried. She's very anxious that I'm pregnant. What if something happens to the baby? What is the next step? Just counsel her or uh, check her uh, um, um, uh, antibody levels, IgM, IgG levels. So if uh, she, uh, because um, the varicella, uh, the transferable uh, period is uh, approximately eight days, okay? So if she was exposed to a person 10 days ago, it means that at that time he did not have a, a varicella, okay? He was not exposed to it. So he maybe got it after uh, 
he met her, he or she met her. So we just have to counsel her and check her, her IgG levels. Similarly, for uh, in postpartum, we can give her rubella vaccine. And if uh, she is taking rubella vaccine, we have to tell her um, that she cannot conceive one month uh, after taking the vaccine. <clears throat> Hepatitis, if the mother is hepatitis B positive, then after the birth of the baby, we have to immunize the baby. Okay, we will give him hepatitis A vaccine and immunoglobulin. If the uh, or if the father is positive, the mother is fine, but if the father is positive, then what will we give the baby? We will give him uh, again, we'll give the baby the uh, hepatitis B vaccine. Antipartum hemorrhage. <clears throat> in this, uh, we have um, placenta um, previa, placental abruption. Both the scenarios come the same, like 24-week-old um, uh, pregnant lady coming to you in the uh, emergency department with bleeding. <clears throat> uh, for the last uh, two, three hours, uh, what is the next step? What One next step, we have to take the history physical examination, do the abdominal ultrasound or TVS, okay? Any one of either do uh, TVS or do the um, abdominal ultrasound. If there's a CDM question, they have given different options. Uh, if any one of the uh, these two is present, select any one of them. Then after, um, first of all, we always have to do that. The history, physical examination, do the abdominal ultrasound to rule out whether it is placenta previa or something else. Don't rely on the uh, question that if they're giving that it is painless bleeding or it is painful bleeding, there's no history of trauma. Uh, so uh, now if the, she has painful bleeding, then uh, we will just jump on to the um, uh, PV because it is painful and placenta previa is painless. No, that is not a criteria. Clinically, this is not a criteria. This is just for the books. So coming with bleeding, first step is do the TVS. Then how will we manage the um, uh, bleeding? That is the next step. We have to do the investigation, basic CBC, PTT, INR, blood group and type. If they have not mentioned that the uh, mother, uh, the blood grouping of the mother, then um, uh, we have to give her ROGAM. So these are the basic things we should know. Do not never perform a digital vaginal examination. It is contraindicated. If you will write digital vaginal examination in a woman coming with um, uh, bleeding after 20 weeks of gestation, then it is a warning sign. You will be considered as a dangerous doctor and it will be marked negatively. So never ever write after 20 weeks, she's coming with bleeding. Never do a vaginal examination. Just perform the ultrasound first. Then we have to, uh, she's coming with bleeding, we have to uh, stabilize the patient. Take the proper history, any history of uh, dizziness, how many uh, uh, pads she has used uh, or soaked in the last uh, few hours, um, any history of trauma, was it the first time, any history of uh, uh, bleeding disorder. After taking all this history, we have to stabilize her with, uh, we'll do the ABCs, pass uh, two large IV, IV lines, start her on IV fluids. Um, if she is going in shock, start her on oxygen and then immediate after stabilizing the patient, uh, immediate obstetrical consultation. If uh, they are saying that, the, okay, the baby is also deteriorating and she is near term, then we have to deliver the baby. If they're saying that, okay, now the baby is fine, she's stabilized, we will try to keep the pregnancy inside, the baby inside as long as possible. Okay. <clears throat> Less than 37 weeks, minimal bleeding, expectant management. Okay. If more than 37 weeks, we have to deliver cesarean delivery. And similarly, for um, if the mother has not been given, um, it's less than 37 weeks, we have to give her steroids, corticosteroids for the lung maturity. <clears throat> same same as placental abruption, the same uh, same scenario, same management. Okay. Vaza previa, um, if uh, it is diagnosed earlier, then they are survival late. Otherwise, mostly if it is not diagnosed, then the baby doesn't survive. So what is Vaza previa? It is unprotected uh, fetal vessels passing over the cervical os. So here, can you see in the diagram, the fetal vessels, they do not have any um, uh, protective layer. 
they're just passing over the cervical os and as a result they start bleeding if they are diagnosed antenatally on ultrasound without labor then there's 97 percent survival rate otherwise there's very high mortality in these what one test we will have to do we have to do the app test and the right staining test and in this we have to do a planned cesarean if, because it is diagnosed early we have to plan a cesarean delivery at 35 to 37 weeks <clears throat> Okay, now next we have um, obstetrical uh, complications. What are the complications? She can present in preterm labor. She can present with pre uh, premature ruptures of the membrane. Depending upon the scenario, we have to uh, treat accordingly. Now, preterm labor is what? Labor before uh, 37 weeks of gestation and after 20 weeks. So between 20 to 37 weeks, if the mother is presenting with uh, contractions, it is preterm labor. But first, we have to take a proper history. We have to assess and check for the timings of the contractions, whether they are regular, irregular, how frequent they are coming. Maybe these are just Braxton Hing contractions, false alarm, and everything is normal. So we just have to reassure her. Ask her about the uh, risk factors, like um, what if she had any uh, cone biopsy done, previous uh, DNC done, previous preterm labor she had in previous pregnancy. Similarly, any family history of preterm birth, smoking, is she a smoker? What is her age, multiple gestations? All of these are the risk factors for preterm labor. Now, if the mother has a history of uh, recurrent um, um, abortions or recurrent preterm pre labors in the uh, second trimester after 20 weeks. So we have to assess whether she has any cervical incompetence or not. Maybe she had undergone a cone biopsy or DNC in the previous pregnancy and now she, her cervix is incompetent. For that, what we have to do, we have to do cervical circulage. And at, at the end of the uh, first trimester and beginning of the second trimester, we do the cir circulage. It is just a stitch, like a suture. We put it in the uh, opening of the cervix and it remains there. And then at the uh, third trimester, what do we do? We remove it. Similarly, for this, um, how we assess the incompetency of the cervix with the history and along with this uh, inflated uh, Foley's catheter during hysterosonogram. Give her progesterone if the cervix is short. Okay. If there's no uh, cervical incompetence, cervix is fine, but still she's uh, going into preterm labor or she has a history, then maybe she has some uh, short cervix. And for that, we give her vaginally uh, uh, progesterone. How do we predict preterm labor? Now, this fetal fibronectin, it is not a diagnostic test. It won't if it, is, it comes because it has a high negative predictive value. So it is not a diagnostic test. Remember that. If the, it is coming uh, positive, it doesn't mean that, okay, now she has she is in preterm labor and we have to um, uh, do the manager accordingly. There are some other criteria also which we have to check according to her presentation and then um, we will uh, move on accordingly. Only on fe fetal fibronectin, we do not depend. What will the uh, clinical presentation be? Regular contractions, two in 10 minutes and cervix more than one centimeter dilated, more than 80% effaced or length less than 2.5 centimeters. If the mother is presenting in preterm labor, first of all, we always have to try to stop the labor or prolong it. Okay, so what is the initial management uh, she's presenting? We will non-pharmacological, we will uh, put her on, um, start her on oxygen, start her on hydration, um, um, uh, put her on left lateral uh, position. Maybe just doing these things, uh, her contractions will uh, become a little less. Okay, if still it doesn't get better, what do we have to do? Then after hydration, bed rest, if there's any pain, um, she will be on pain. We will give her analgesics and avoid doing repeated pelvic examination because of the increased risk of infection. 
Now, after doing the initial management, if she is not getting better, the uh, contractions are not stopping, we will start her on tocolytics. What are these? These are indomethacine and uh, nifedipine. They will just prolong the uh, um, time of delivery. They do not just stop it. They just prolong it so that if we need to give her steroids, we can give her steroids. So a pregnant lady coming to you after the initial, initial management, still her uh, she's on contractions. What is the one next step we have to do? We have to give her either nifedipine or indomethacine. Okay. Along with that, we have to give her corticosteroids. If uh, she is um, uh, RH uh, negative, we have to give her Rogam. So these are the things we have to give her during this time frame we are uh, taking by giving her the tocolytics. In that time frame, we have to give her all these things so that if the baby delivers, uh, there is a uh, baby doesn't have any problem with the lungs. The lungs are mature. The baby, if a baby, if she's RH negative, okay, uh, there won't be any um, uh, possibility of um, uh, cross um, uh, matching or uh, what do you call it? Um, Erythrobastosis fetalis. So in the next pregnancy, so we have to do uh, check all these things during that time. If she's coming with a rupture of membrane, a pregnant lady at a uh, uh, 30 weeks uh, coming with a, a gush of uh, uh, water and um, in the emergency department maybe in contraction not in contraction labor has started or not started what is the next step then we will do the investigations are the uh, first we'll do the speculum examination to check whether the fluid is coming out or no then we will do the nitrazine blue test okay Ferning we will do and we will do the ultrasound. These are the investigations we have to do. <clears throat> Along with that, we admit the mother for expectant management, monitor the vitals every four hours, avoid uh, repetitive vaginal examinations because the increased risk of uh, infections. If she's not in labor, then just manage her symptomatically. Try to uh, um, keep the uh, baby inside the mother as long as possible. Give her steroids, give her... Um, a test for her any maybe she has uti maybe she has any stis gbs infection so i do all these tests so that we can um, uh, treat her accordingly if she has any sti or she has any utis we can start her on antibiotics if she she is gbs positive then we will have to give the penicillin uh, to the mother um, during the delivery Now at uh, 20, uh, 22 to 25 weeks, if she's coming with from, we have to in, uh, consider the counseling of the parents because it is the baby is very small. Increased risk of preterm infants and increased chances the baby won't survive. So we have to counsel them. 26 to 34 weeks, same expectant management and counsel the uh, parents. At 34 to 36 weeks, um, there are increased risk of uh, death from RDS or neonatal sepsis. More than 37 weeks, just deliver the baby. Okay. Postum pregnancy, <clears throat> pregnancy more than 42 weeks gestational age can be idiopathic. Maybe there's an anencephalic fetus. Um, that is the baby doesn't have the pituitary gland. They don't have any brain. So th these also, they are postum. Okay. Incorrect date. Incorrect date is the most common cause of postum pregnancy for um, any IUGR, uh, small for gestational age. Maybe the, they didn't, the dates are not correct for any other, um, uh, if we are considering like preterm delivery, even in that. So incorrect dates can be the mother didn't give you the proper history. She was not uh, checked properly in the uh, during the uh, throughout her pregnancy. There were no follow up done, and now most important cause can be incorrect dates. So after forty two weeks, what do we have to do? We just have to. If there's no complete uh, contraindications. Just uh, deliver the baby. If they're uh, giving you a scenario of a, a mother coming to you with uh, no fetal movements for the last two weeks, uh, sorry, weeks uh, for the la last one day or two days, and on ultrasound, you find that th there is no fetal heartbeat, okay? The mother is coming with history of no fetal movements. What is the next step? We have to do the ultrasound to confirm it. On the ultrasound, if there is no fetal heartbeat, next step will be 
one step we have to do is first we have to counsel the parents because it's a shock for them, right? So one next step we have to do, we have to counsel the parents. After counseling, then all of these things come that, okay, uh, what are the other um, tests you have to do? You have to check her for any uh, FDP, for any coagulopathy. There can be any risk of DIC. You have to do uh, PT, PTTT, uh, and um, FDP, fibrinogen, CBC. These tests come. They are important. But first, one step, if they're asking, we have to do the psychological counseling of the family. Pro, uh, um, connect them with some social support services, bereavement support services. After that, what are the investigations we have to do? We have to do along with that. We have to check um, any hemoglobin A1C level, her uh, TSH level, any uh, UTIs, infections. Uh, maybe she has some uh, torch infection. We have to screen for that and then deliver the baby. Induction of labor and deliver the baby. In IUGR, what do we have? Um, estimated fetal weight less than 10th percentile for gestational age on ultrasound. So the fetal weight would be less than 10th percentile. What are the risk factors? Due to maternal malnutrition, maybe there are some uh, infections the mother has. She's a smoker. She's alcoholic. Um, uh, she has some underlying disease, like maybe she's diabetic. Maybe uh, she is um, not um, high sexual activity, doesn't take her diet properly. Any can be the causes for that. First, we have to assess whether she is uh, the IUGR is in early pregnancy or later pregnancy. In early pregnancy, if it is IUGR, it is mostly symmetric. Symmetric means that the ratio of the head and the abdomen, it will be the same. It will be proportionally, the baby will be small. That is a symmetric IUGR. And asymmetric, what will be the, there will be a disproportionality. Okay, the fetal abdomen is smaller than the fetal head. So according to the pregnancy, the uh, abdomen will be smaller as compared to the head. So that is asymmetric. For the symmetric, the most important, um, it is mostly in the early pregnancy and it is due to some infections like torch infection. But for asymmetric, it is later in the pregnancy and uh, mostly due to mother malnutrition. She's not eating properly. And because of that, uh, the baby is now presenting with uh, IUGR. We should know the difference between the two. What is the difference and how will we investigate? We have to do the symphysiofundal height at every visit. We have to do the uh, ultrasound and Doppler analysis to check for the blood flow. But how will we diagnose it with the ultrasound? On the ultrasound, we will see that, okay, now the baby is IUGR. Management, if there's some maternal causes, like she's a smoker, alcoholic, nutrition problems, we'll counsel her. Stop smoking, stop taking alcohol, uh, keep your diet, uh, improve your diet, take um, a healthy diet, and so that the uh, modifiable factors can be treated. If she has some underlying uh, other infection, torch infection, we will uh, treat, uh, um, treat her for those. Macrosomia, baby is very large and uh, more than 90th percentile for a particular gestational age or more than 400 grams. What are the clinical features? Increased risk of prenatal, uh, perinatal mortality, CBD uh, and birth injuries, shoulder dystocia, fetal bone fractures. Um, um, a baby is delivered of a diabetic mother. And on the assessment of the baby, the mother was diabetic or the baby was uh, macrosomic. And now on, on the initial assessment of the baby, after one to two hours, when you assess the baby, you find that the baby is having seizures. So what can be the cause? Because the mother was uh, uh, diabetic, maybe the baby is having seizures because of hypoglycemia. So what will we do? We will check the uh, glucose levels. We will like, check the calcium levels. These two tests we have to do. Just the simple management, if she's hyperglycemic, diabetic, uh, we will study, uh, go through this in the uh, later on in the chapter. And if the, if the baby is more than 500 grams or mother is non-diabetic and more than uh, 4,500 grams, then we have to do the cesarean delivery. What important over here is that if the mother is, uh, the why the what are the causes of baby to be macrosomic and what 
can be the complications. Okay. For uh, oligohydromnios uh, oligo and polyhydromnios, what is polyhydromnios? The AFI amniotic fluid index is more than um, uh, 25 centimeter. Ultrasound, deep, uh, single deepest pocket, more than 8, uh, eight centimeter. They can be different causes um, like multiple pregnancy, any um, underlying mother is diabetic, Chromosomal abnormalities, maybe the baby has a tracheoesophageal fistula, duodenal atresia, all of these are the common etiologies. What do we have to do? Just uh, uh, proper uh, uh, monitoring, follow up, and assess for any cord prolapse. So, complication can be cord prolapse, rupture of the membranes, placental abruption, malpresentation, and also PPS after delivery. Management, screen for any infections, any uh, fetal causes, do ultrasounds. And if uh, needed, we have to do therapeutic amniocentesis, but very last step. For us, the main is we have to screen the mother for the disease and the infection and do um, ultrasound evaluation. Similarly, for oligohydromnios, the AF, uh, amniotic fluid index will be less than 5 centimeter. Uh, it can be due to uh, any uh, urinary tract abnormality of the fetus, any Obstruction in the uh, renal obstruction. The mother is on taking any medications like AIDS inhibitors. Maybe there's a ruptured membranes, and due to that, now the fluid is uh, less. So we have to assess all these things. Do the serial ultrasound. Check the mother. Look for any deformities in the babies. Maybe there can be a, a cord compression. If uh, try to um, proceed as long as the pregnancy as possible. Keep the mother on uh, hydration, increase fluids, increase IV, um, um, increase just increase the fluids. And then if needed, we can uh, do therapeutic, um, like uh, injections of the fluid in the uh, belly of the mother. Okay. Antipartum depression, any mother coming, uh, if she's giving you any signs of depression, Antipartum and post uh, antenatal and postnatal, like either she can present with depression during pregnancy or after the baby has been delivered. So just look for the signs. If the signs are positive, assess her according what is the assessment criteria. We have to use the Edinburgh postnatal depression scale. Just know the name. We have to assess her with this. In pregnant lady, we use this Edinburgh postnatal depression scale. Provide her with um, um, a cognitive behavior therapy, psychological support. If needed, if still she is on depression, we have to start her on antidepressants. Okay, SSRIs are safe in pregnancy to start with. Then we have multiple gestation. What is twin twin transfusion syndrome? Then one baby is getting. Um, all the nutrients, the one is the donor and the other is the receiver. So the donor baby is, what is he doing? He's giving all his uh, um, uh, nutrients and everything, blood supply is going to the recipient and the recipient will have uh, uh, polyhydromnios, he will be large and the uh, donor one, he will be small. So either what is the treatment? Uh, investigation is by ultrasound screening and treatment is petroscopic laser ablation of the placental vascular anosmosis. Or uh, what do we do? We transfuse the blood to the donor twin because he's giving everything to the recipient one. Or decompress uh, by amniocentesis for the uh, recipient twin. We take out the fluid and therapeutic amniocentesis. Breach presentation. The baby is presenting with um, the buttock or the foot as the presenting part. Okay. And what is the one? Uh, how will we... Um, invest uh, um, diagnose it by the uh, examination physical examination and on ultrasound what is the management counsel the mother and tell her that uh, after 36 weeks we can go for external cephalic version and ecv while doing ecv we have to tell her about the uh, what are the risk factors and what can be um, where did it go it was written somewhere here. Okay. So what are the risk factors? And if uh, during ECV anything goes, uh, goes wrong, we will have to deliver the baby. Okay. 
and after the ecb we have to if she is negative always remember we have to give the mother rogam there can be chances of placental abruption any cord compression any fetal uh, compromise then we will immediately have to deliver the baby through cesarean delivery okay then we have hypertension if the mother already has pre-existing hypertension before 20 weeks, then it is pre-existing. Before 20 weeks of uh, gestation, she uh, has a high blood pressure that is pre-existing uh, hypertension. But after um, 20 weeks, then it is gestational hypertension. Now in gestational uh, hypertension, either it is simple, it is just after 20 weeks, blood pressure is more than 140 by 90 mm -hmm. and everything else is uh, normal. Just the blood pressure is raised. It can be preeclampsia or eclampsia. Preeclampsia, either it was pre before she was uh, pregnant, she was already hypertensive or after pregnancy, she developed hypertension. And now along with that hypertension, she has protein urea or any um, adverse conditions like end organ dysfunction. Then that will be preeclampsia. And preeclampsia can lead to eclampsia in which the patient might develop seizures. So we always have to prevent preeclampsia. If the mother is presenting with severe hypertension, with a, a very high uh, or uh, with seizures, eclampsia, just stabilize her, start her on IV lines, uh, IV fluids, uh, stabilize the mother, give her labetolol, give her magnesium sulfate. And once she is stabilized, the definitive diagnosis is we have to deliver the baby. Okay. There is no other um, uh, second thought. Even if the baby is premature, we have to deliver it. Okay. This is the definitive treatment of eclampsia. What will the uh, symptoms be? Uh, clinical manifestation of eclampsia symptoms that may occur before the seizure include persistent front. She might present with some headache, blurred vision, photophobia, upper quadrant epigastric pain, altered mental status. So we, in history, we have to ask her all these things. Whenever, if a hypertensive uh, mother is coming, we have to ask her, do you have any photophobia, any blurring of the vision, any headache, any pain in the uh, epigastrium? Maybe she's proceeding towards the HELP syndrome. All of these things have to be assessed. If at any point we need, we see that she needs to be delivered, uh, she needs to be admitted, just counsel her and tell her that, okay, we, you are uh, developing the signs of eclampsia. You cannot go home. We have to admit you. And uh, the uh, medication that is safe in pregnancy is labetolol. Okay, the first line we use is labetolol, um, methyl dopa, hydralazine. All these are used. This is the same. Your medications. ABC, rural left lateral position, give her oxygen, uh, anti-hypertensive, start her with, with start her on um, that uh, magnesium sulfate and then deliver the baby. You should know that we, even if they're telling that, okay, now she is fine, she is stabilized, what is the next step? Deliver, deliver the baby. Obstetrical consultation for delivery. Similarly, for diabetes mellitus, either she's already diabetic or uh, she has gestational diabetes uh, mellitus. If the already diabetic mother is a uh, lady is coming to you and she wants to conceive, so first thing we have to start her on, switch her on um, insulin. We'll stop her metformin and we will switch her to insulin. Because um, uh, anti-hypoglycemic there's no known uh, evidence that they can be teratogenic. They can't be, so we just have to switch her. Okay. And if onset of diabetes during pregnancy, then that is gestational diabetes. Mellitus. And when do we test uh, for that? At 24 to 28 weeks of gestational age. How do we uh, test for gestational diabetes mellitus? We do the screening test, that is 24 to 28 weeks. Either we do this uh, two-step test, that is 50 gram non-fasting OGCT test, oral glucose challenge test. If the value of the postprandial uh, glucose is more than or equal to 11.1, uh, 11 the mother is uh, diabetic, okay? If it is coming after one hour, 7.8, between 7.8 to 11, then we have to proceed to the second step. 
okay and the second step will be 75 gram oral glucose test and if any one of this value is present then the mother is uh, diabetic or we just do simple uh, 75 gram oral glucose tolerance test it's a one a one step screening test and if any one of this is present one hour post prandial more than 10 two hour more than 8.5 then the mother is diabetic okay so uh, we will give tell her about the uh, diet take a proper diet take care of uh, avoid sugars do physical exercise initiate insulin if she's on uh, already diabetic and she's taking uh, antihypoglycemic stop them and switch it to the, uh, those uh, switch to insulin after uh, postpartum what do we have to do we have to stop insulin and diabetic diet and monitor the mother and at six weeks when she's coming at uh, follow-up we have to do the 75 gram oral glucose tolerance test to reassess where she stands Okay. And now when we are delivering the baby, we have to check the baby for any hypoglycemia, for any, um, yes, mainly hypoglycemia. Yes. Okay. Complications of diabetes in pregnancy, retinal main that is important is this hypoglycemia, hyperbilirubinemia, jaundice, hypocalcemia, polycythemia. So they might give you the baby's um, uh, the uh, hemoglobin level is very high and the hist in the history the mother had uh, gestational diabetes mellitus so it is normal we'll it will get fine with time just uh, counseling and serial uh, checkups for hypocalcemia hypoglycemia the baby can present with seizures so we will check the baby's uh, glucose level and calcium levels. Um, for uh, group B streptococcus, uh, this uh, the GBS it is a risk factor. If the mother is positive, the risk factor is for the baby. Okay, uh, the mother would be asymptomatic. There won't be any even after the uh, delivery. The mother won't have any symptoms. What will be the uh, who will be affected? The baby will be affected. And to protect the baby, we have to do the screening test. And if the mother is positive, then during the delivery, we have to give her continuously uh, penicillin every four hours IV until the baby is born. If the um, at the screening at thirty five weeks, the mother is fine. But previously in the previous uh, pregnancy. Is it written over uh, less than 37 weeks of gestation at birth? Prolonged rupture of membranes. Where is it? Yes. So, indications for interpartum antibiotic. So, if the previous infant with invasive GBS disease, they give you a scenario where the mother is uh, her now, her GBS screening is negative, but her previous pregnancy, the baby uh, had the, uh, the baby was affected with GBS. Okay then we will in this pregnancy also we will give a penicillin remember that it is a question and mostly we just confuse it that okay now the screening is negative we don't need to do anything even if the previous pregnancy she was positive the baby was effective affected then we have to give the mother gbs bacteria during any trimester of the current pregnancy positive gbs vaginal rectal screening culture in late gestation during current pregnancy unknown status if the mother is unknown she's coming to you for the first time just in labor no um, antipartum care uh, antenatal care then we have to give her gbs prophylaxis during the uh, delivery of the baby so the, all of these are the and if uh, for example we are screening her at 35 weeks so the time period for rescreening is uh, five weeks okay if we start uh, did it at 35 now after 35 36 37 38 39 40 and she is delivering at 41 weeks then we will again rescreen her for uh, gbs okay and what if uh, what do we have to do we have to give her penicillin g every four hours during the delivery uh, to prevent the baby from the uh, disease okay gbs duty i we discussed it even asymptomatic, treat her. What are we giving her? Amoxicillin, nitrofurantine, and every month and every um, uh, visit, we have to do the urine culture. And how do we screen for uh, UTI in pregnancy? That is urine culture and sensitivity, not the urine analysis. Okay, remember urine culture and sensitivity. We have to screen her with culture and sensitivity. Infections during pregnancy, chickenpox. Um, I discussed it. Okay, if the, how the exposure, what kind of scenario they can give you and what is the next step we have to do, give her varicella. 
Similarly, for cytomegalovirus, these are this is what torch infection. So the baby can have mental retardation, cerebral calcification, hydrocephalus, microcephaly, deafness, chorioamnitis. The mother can be asymptomatic, no symptoms, just the serological screening, and there is no specific treatment for it. Parvovirus, I discussed, mother or a lady, if she works in a daycare or she has children who go to the daycare and they have the symptoms. And now the mother also presents with flu-like symptoms. So we just have to do the viral PCR and uh, serial ultrasounds. Hepatitis B, mother is positive. The baby is delivered, then give the uh, baby the vaccine and immunoglobulin. Herpes simplex virus, uh, just a clinical diagnosis. If the mother uh, has the symptoms, then what will we do? Uh, we will give her acyclovir. Okay. And uh, if the uh, during uh, pregnancy she has no uh, herpetic lesions in her vaginal area, then we can deliver vaginally. But if the mother has the, uh, the lesions in her uh, at the time of the delivery, then we have to do a cesarean section. In HIV, uh, mother is coming during pregnancy or before uh, she wants to conceive, she is HIV positive, she will continue taking her uh, triple therapy, antiretroviral therapy during pregnancy. Okay, they are not contraindicated, she has to take throughout the pregnancy. If she didn't take any uh, medications, her viral count uh, was high, then we will do uh, go for cesarean delivery. But if everything is fine, she continued her medications, the viral load is um, okay, then we can uh, move to uh, vaginal delivery. And if uh, the mother, after uh, the delivery of the baby, uh, mother wants to breastfeed it, we will not allow because it is a contraindication. If the mother insists, we have to report to the CAS. Similarly, for rubella, uh, hearing loss, cataract, these are all the symptoms in the baby, mitral regurgitation, hepatitis, CNS defects, osseous changes. The mother might have rash, fever, or she may be asymptomatic. We have to do the IgM levels to check if she's positive or not. No vaccination. Just, um, what do we do? Just monitor the mother. For syphilis also, they are coming for the first time, every uh, universal screening within all the pregnant ladies with VDRL. If VDRL comes out positive, then we move to the confirmatory test, that is the microscopy. And what do we give? Benzathine, benzathine penicillin G, IM single dose. Toxoplasmosis, same torch infection, IgM and IgG serology, and uh, just serially monitor the mother. Then venous thromboembolism, what, uh, what the mother can present with, uh, uh, that is DVT. Okay, in DVT, uh, either she has a history of DVT and she is uh, a preg a lady with a history of DVT and she is on uh, warf uh, sorry, uh, yes, warfarin long term. Now she wants to conceive, we will switch her to low molecular weight heparin. If during pregnancy she comes with the symptoms of DVT, that is uh, swelling of the calf, uh, pain in the um, in the uh, in the leg, you check, you do the uh, Doppler ultrasound, and it is DVT. We will start her on low molecular weight heparin. In pregnancy, we do not give uh, the mother, or even after delivery of the baby, we do not start her on warfarin. Okay, it is contraindicated. So even before pregnancy, during pregnancy. After the delivery of the baby, we are giving the mother low molecular weight heparin. Okay, and we will continue it for three to six uh, months. Yeah. Now, how are we monitoring? This is the same uh, which I discussed, the category A, B. There, these are the uh, causes of abnormal fetal heart rate monitoring. If the if presenting with tachycardia, what can be the causes? Hyperthermia, anemia, dehydration, fever, fetal factors. Maybe the baby has anemia, infection, um, any congenital abnormalities. The mother is on sympathomimetics. Similarly, for bradycardia, 
maybe hypothermia, hypotension. You can just go through these um, to just to know what are the main causes. And if the mother is presenting with abnormal fetal heart rate, this is the uh, management. Put her in left lateral de uh, decubitus position, start her on oxygen, give her IV fluids, okay? Mostly after these three steps, it will help. If it doesn't, then we have to do the uh, fetal scalp stimulation, scalp electrode, or scalp, we'll check the scalp pH. Stop oxytocin. If she's on oxytocin, she's delivering. Um, then we have to stop the oxytocin. Notify the physician and vaginal delivery to rule out cord collapse. Mainly these first three, st four steps are important. Similarly, if uh, though, if she has decelerations, if the deceleration is before, this is the contraction coming and the deceleration is starting from here. If it is starting before the contractions, then it is called early deceleration. And most important cause can be due to head compression. It is normal, okay? Early decelerations are normal and they are due to uh, during uh, um, delivery or during when the mother is in labor uh, with contractions, the head compresses and with the compress uh, compression of the head, the supply to the um, uh, veins, it also... Uh, um, like it compresses the supply for that time period what happens uh, the baby might uh, show some deceleration so this is normal we won't need to do anything proceed with the normal um, and delivery procedure if they are variable like this these are the contractions and the um, fetal heart rate is showing there's no variation with the contractions so it can be due to cord compression or in second stage forceful pushing with contractions so we have to rule out what is the cause and deliver the baby. If there is late deceleration, then there is some uteroplacental desufficiency. Okay, and we have to uh, immediately insufficiency and we have to deliver the baby. Might have to go for uh, cesarean delivery. For induction of labor, we should know the methods of induction of labor. Okay, what are the methods? either cervical ripening, amniotomy. If there is um, a rest in the uh, second stage of uh, labor, then first we will go for amniotomy, okay? If there is um, a rest, uh, the, the baby is coming down, but still uh, um, the cervix is uh, ripened, but uh, the labor is not progressing. We have to first do the rupture of the membranes. Okay, after that, still not working. If they say the cervix is not fully uh, dilated, then we have to put the intravaginal postaglandin E2 or E1. Okay, and along with this, um, after rupture of membrane, after postaglandin E2, uh, still not working, then start the mother on oxytocin. We are already giving her oxytocin during when she is in labor. So we'll just increase the dose of oxytocin. Okay, so what is the, for augmenting, for in, uh, fastening the labor, what will we do? Amniotomy and oxytocin. Abnormal shoulder dystocia is important. Uh, maybe the baby is large for gestational age or the mother was obese, she was diabetic, multiparity, and now she has uh, shoulder dist uh, the baby. Uh, after delivery of the uh, head of the baby, uh, the shoulder is stuck. Okay, uh, or the head uh, comes out and it again moves back. So this is the turtle sign. We have to look for it. And um, what is the one step we have to do? Mac, uh, Mac Roberts maneuver. Okay, Mac Roberts maneuver, we should know the name. They will, we just need to know the name of the, we don't need to know the procedures. So approach to the management of uh, shoulder dystocia is ask for help. Uh, do the Mac, uh, Mac Roberts maneuver. After that, Anterior shoulder disinfection, release posterior shoulder by rotating it uh, anteriorly with the hand in the vagina under ad adequate anesthesia, manual corkscrew, episiotomy, and um, that's it. So mainly McRoberts maneuver is important, manual corkscrew, episiotomy. Okay. A baby is delivered after prolonged uh, delivery or uh, after shoulder dyst uh, dystocia and on examination of the baby you find uh, that the one of the arm of the baby is twisted uh, uh, backwards or uh, the uh, one uh, uh, hand is in a claw like shape so 
what is the next management just reassure or follow up because it can be either herbs palsy due to the compression of the brachial plexus at c5 to c7 or clumkey's palsy at c8 to uh, 10 1 uh, t1 so uh, resolves within the six months uh, we just have to do serial uh, follow-up and reassure the mother that is going to be fine okay know this uh, at what level the uh, herbs palsy is there and at what level a uh, clumpy palsy this is important you should know the uh, levels also and the management is just reassurance umbilical cord prolapse uh, mother is in deli uh, delivery room in the labor room and all of a sudden, on assessment, the uh, fetal heart rate, there's a rapid deceleration. It goes into the uh, um, the fetal heart rate goes below 110, like maybe in 90s or 60s. And on further examination, you see that there was a gush of fluid. On a pelvic examination, you notice that the cord is outside. What is What you have to do? Put the mother on knee chest position. Put your hand inside the mother's vagina. Uh, put the uh, uh, cord back. Okay, hand inside and in that same position, you will take her to the uh, emergency, uh, uh, to the operating room and conduct the cesarean delivery. Okay, emergency cesarean, oxygen to mother, monitor fetal heart rate, elevate pressure of the presenting part on the cord by elevating fetal head with pelvic exam, keep cord warm and moist by replacing into the vagina and applying warm saline soaks, roll mother on all four or trend position, and deliver the baby okay just move the cord inside back don't do anything and rush the mother to the uh, operating theater then in a uh, uterine rupture they will give you a scenario in which the mother uh, comes to you in the sign of shock a pregnant lady presenting to do with uh, to you in labor with shock uh, you cannot palpate the uh, fetal parts there is no engagement of the head and uh, she has a history of previous cesarean delivery or any other um, uh, um, uh, surgery of the abdomen so it is most probably due to a uh, rupture of the uterus and now we have to move on to the cesarean delivery immediate Amniotic fluid embol uh, embolism, uh, risk factors are placental abruption, rapid labor, multiparity, uterine rupture, uterine manipulation, induction medications, and procedures. Presentation, sudden onset of respiratory distress, cardiovascular collapse, and coagulopathy. Acute respiratory distress syndrome and left ventricular dysfunction uh, seen in survivors. Management is in the ICU by multidisciplinary team, oxygen, ventilation support, fluid resuscitation, inotropic support, intubation, and coagulopathy correction. So immediately after delivery, the mother can present with uh, signs of uh, distress and hypoxia and shock. So we just have to get, uh, manage her and multidisciplinary support. Goriamnitis, mother presenting to you with a uh, foul smelling uh, discharge, high grade fever on examination. When you uh, do the speculum examination, vagina examination, there's pollen discharge coming out. Um, admit the mother. May, uh, she might give you a history of uh, rupture of membranes or uh, leakage of fluid for the past one week or uh, she coming from, uh, from a rural area where um, she was uh, being assessed by some um, a midwife um, in all these cases what we have to do we have to start, admit her start her on antibiotics okay antipyretics uh, and depending upon the uh, condition we have to deliver the baby so the first step will be uh, iv antibiotics admit start on antibiotics and antipyretics and monitor the mother if um, during uh, um, a labor meconium is passed or even then we have to just deliver the baby because baby is going in fetal distress. He can uh, swallow it. And due to that, we just have to immediately deliver the baby. And what is the treatment? Call respiratory therapy, neonatology, or pediatric to the delivery room. Closely monitor fetal heart rates for signs of fetal distress. Then the complications of vaginal uh, forceps and vacuum. For forceps, the complications are cephalhematoma, uh, cord compression, 
and sub, uh, for vacuum it is a subglial hemorrhage and a septaponeurotic hemorrhage for um, the mother had a difficult labor prolonged labor and um, uh, for which she was uh, forceps were used and now after the delivery while assessing the ba baby the baby has some bogey swelling on the uh, forehead okay so it is what mm, cephal hematoma just reassure follow up nothing it is going to get uh, fine all by itself then we have a uh, postpartum hemorrhage pregnant um, uh, after uh, three to four weeks uh, sorry three to four months of pregnancy delivery uh, mother is presenting to you with uh, amenorrhea uh, no uh, breast uh, uh, milk uh, fatigue lethargy with a history of um, um, uh, postpartum hemorrhage or uh, increased uh, bleeding during the delivery so what can uh, be the cause maybe she had postpartum hemorrhage and now she has Sheehan syndrome okay so we have to ask her about the proper history what happened during the pregnancy uh, what could be the uh, during the delivery how much did she bleed how did they assess you since how long you're um, so postpartum hemorrhage after uh, delivery, the mother is pre uh, presenting. It can be a uh, Sheehan syndrome. What are the four T's of postpartum hemorrhage? It is due to uterine atony. Tissue may be retained uh, retain placenta is there. Trauma, any laceration, any uh, massive uh, tear, or uh, due to some um, coagulopathy. And postpartum hemorrhage can even present within 24 hours after delivery. It is not only during the delivery. Okay, management is ABC is called for help, two large bore IV lines, run crystalloids, uh, CBC, coagulation profile, uh, fibrinogen, cross and type packed RBCs we have to do, treat the underlying cause. If there is retained placenta, what will we do? We will do a, a uterine massage and along with that, we will, we will slowly uh, manually uh, retract the uh, placenta. If still it is not coming out, then uh, we, what will we do? We have to do the uh, manual uh, retraction. Put your hand inside and uh, remove all the uh, placenta or we have to go for DNC. And what will be the complication of DNC or manual retraction? It can be Asherman syndrome. The mother might present with a history of DNC or um during the delivery or um, uh, PPH and uh, due to uh, retained placenta, she, uh, there was some manual extraction and now she has amenorrhea. So it can be Asherman syndrome. Keep these uh, small scenarios like one can be linked to another. This can be a cause of that. So you should know that, okay, this can also occur in pregnancy. And now she's, even if she's presenting after uh, four months, five months with amenorrhea and she had a DNC um, or any history of P uh, PPH, this could be a leading cause of uh, Asherman syndrome or any leading cause of uh, Sheehan syndrome. So according to the history, we have to relate everything. Medical therapy, what do we give? Uh, we have to uh, start the mother on oxytocin. Then we have to give her a gotamine or carboprost. If she has a hypertensive, then we will give her carboprost. If um, in hypertension, ergotamine is contraindicated. But if she has any asthma, she's asthmatic, she has any uh, liver problem, any cardiovascular disease, then card, uh, carboprost is contraindicated. Similarly, oxytocin, ergotamine, uh, mesoprostol, and tronex uh, tronexamic acid. By manual massage, uterine packing, and bakery uh, balloon for tamponade. If still not, then there are other like uh, DNC, uterine artery embolization, hysterectomy is the last resort, depending on the uh, cause. If the cause is retained placenta, same. ABCs, uh, <clears throat> after that, the, the, the traction of the, uh, do the fundal massage and uh, start the mother on oxytocin and, <clears throat> excuse me, um, uh, try to remove the baby, uh, sorry, the placenta with uh, traction. If the placenta is not coming out, then we have to move uh, to the manual remover or DNC. And we will give the mother antibiotic. If there's uterine inversion, all of the uterus uh, comes out, we will immediately put the uterus back and 
same all of these are emergencies so do the abcs iv fluid start call for help and then just uh, put the uh, uterus back and uh, do the massage and start the mother on tocolytics postpartum pyrexia she's coming uh, with a high grade fever it can be due to endometritis or any mastitis what do we have to give we have to start her on antibiotics after proper history you just start her antibiotics Then you should know the difference uh, between uh, postpartum blues, postpartum depression, and psychosis. Okay, blues is just for 3 to 10 days. Within 3 to 10 days after uh, delivery, she is presenting with uh, some depressed mood, not able to adjust, uh, low energy, not able to feed the baby, fatigue, cryingness, uh, increase um, uh, hopelessness. So just reassure the mother. Okay, but if it is more than uh, um, 10 days, then this is depression. And in depression, now we have to uh, uh, treat the mother if it is depression. Do the cognitive behavior therapy assess on postnatal depression scale, start her on cognitive behavior therapy and start her on antidepressant. If she is presenting with um, symptoms of psychosis, Okay, she's saying that she's suicidal, she doesn't like the baby, she wants to kill the baby, um, any harm she's presenting to the baby, then we have to admit the mother and uh, keep the baby away from the mother and start her on antipsychotics. Then after in postpartum care, the mother is coming the same we discussed in the, uh, earlier that uh, counsel her about contraception, about breastfeeding, ask her about um, depression, rule out depression, uh, do the basic test. Um, if she was diabetic, do the oral glucose test. If she needs um, um, a pap smear uh, is due, then do her pap smear. Depending mm -hmm. upon her condition, add any other test or just uh, do the psychological counseling, counsel her on contraceptives and breastfeeding that is important if she's coming uh, for contraceptives if she says that i want to start contraceptives then after six weeks uh, she can start or contraceptive pills okay okay we are done with our ops, ops. now you can ask your questions <laughs> 